Hey, it's Greg Milby, community storyteller for Kentucky's Heartland, and welcome in. And to my left over here, I have Bryce Shoemate, Chief Emergency Services Officer with Hardin County Government. Oh, thank you. To my right, a guy that, again, don't be offended, U of L fans, if uh, uh, oh. in his, his outfit. This is uh, Greg Lee. He is the CEO of No Land RECC. Greg, good to see you. Hey, you too. I, I, we should have talked about your attire before you joined us today on the show. For those listening to the podcast, he is uh, wearing UK gear today. Yeah, I, it's uh, okay. I didn't get the memo, but uh, now I know where you stay. So and, I'll and, keep and that in mind. It wouldn't have mattered anyway, would it? No. Would have, uh, That's would because have. he went to a good school. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> All right, so winter is here. Winter uh, just doesn't necessarily mean basketball season and bowl season. It means, uh, well, winter and cold and things like that. So you guys are here to talk about winter preparedness. Uh, we've got a little bit of dosage of winter so far, but uh, I, I've seen some numbers that were talking about we could, some of the experts are saying we could get upwards of like 45 inches of snow this winter. Yeah, they're, they're thinking of harsh winter. So who does it freak out more? Does it freak out Hardin County government, who's got to take care of the roads, or does it freak out Nolan RECC, who's got to make sure the, the power stays on? My guess would be snow probably bothers Bryce more. Ice, ice bothers me more, for sure. Ice is a no-go at all. Oh, yeah. Most of the time, we're okay with snow. But, uh, but if you get that perfect combination of freezing rain and you've got ice and it sticks to the lines and the poles, mm -hmm. that's, that's a big problem for us. All right, so uh, what can residents do to prepare in advance for winter? You know, now that it's here, I know I've always heard, and I'm horrible about this, and as I was driving here this morning and thinking about the interview, I was like, oh, I've got to get that in there. <laughs> I don't have a winter preparedness kit. I don't have an emergency you, kit. So you, you, what should we do for that, Bryce? You need to have a survival kit not only for your house but for your car as well. So talk about the survival kit. What's in this survival kit? Well, in both vehicle and, and house, you need to have a first aid kit. Um, you need to have in your home enough food and water to take care of your entire family to include the pets now for seven days because it used to be three days and thinking that first responders would be able to get to you in three days to take care of you, get to a shelter, whatever. But now we've learned that over the last few years of the disasters that occurred seven days before a lot of times before first responders are able to get to you and if you think about the 09 ice storm with the limbs that were down and the ice that was you know out it was hard to get into some areas in hardin county so not only do you need to have enough food and water for everybody make sure that you've got enough of your uh, medication so that you don't run out should something like mm -hmm. that happen money like paper money put away somewhere because the ATMs are not going to work. But I just print mine at home anyway. So Make sure you've got enough fuel. Um, and, you know, uh, Greg and I have talked about this in, in other places, but, you know, people should really start to think about, especially if you are one of those patients that needs oxygen or you, need, you have some kind of medical need where you need electricity all the time, you need to think about having an emergency generator um, and some type of alternate heat source. So, it, you know, those kind of things, and, and you need to make sure that something that you used to do, you need to make sure that you have a radio, a battery-powered mm -hmm. radio. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't hurt to have a NOAA, uh, a weather radio that operates on batteries as well. And it, Flashlights. And it, the thing with, with technology, too, is advanced now that when you talk radio, it doesn't necessarily even just mean a 100% battery-powered radio uh, if you have, uh, you know, battery backups for a, a, a phone you know a lot of radio stations and the are weather streaming. are streaming online now too so so you have that option of course if you lose power and you lose you lose internet you're going to be using your data that's right <laughs> you only that's get right so much i of mean that. and so, people cannot it's like those cell phones are attached to their side you know <laughs> now talking about heat sources when you have an alternate heat source uh kerosene uh, there's there's some there's some things to really be thinking about when you when you have a kerosene heater. That's right, and you you you're looking at some dangerous fumes in the house, and so what we also recommend is that you put a seal monitor in your house as well, uh, because that will detect uh, noxious fumes that you know seals um, odorless, and we won't know that we're being poisoned because it's it's truly a silent killer, hmm. um, but. Those types of devices that are battery powered can be in the home as well, um, you know, to let, to alert you that you've got a dangerous level of CO in the house um, and that you need to get out. 
The other problem was we saw during ice storm is people were using their gas grills to cook inside, Greg. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that's dangerous. And, and we also talk about if you've got a, uh, a, a backup generator, you don't want to leave it in the garage running because then those fumes yeah. come in the house. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's some dangers. When we talk about some of these things, there's dangers to them as well. All right. So speaking of generators, and Greg will come to you now and talk about those because I know a lot of folks, especially after the ice storm, have these generators and some of them they've tried to hook them into their into their home uh that can be dangerous when we, we talk about electricity and we talk about coming back down the line with right. the, with, with the electric company yeah so generators are great lots of hazards of generators although you know we take great pride in in, in keeping our service available nearly all the time whenever we have a, a weather event or a disaster that uh, prohibits service to some people it takes time to restore and that's just the nature of the beast uh, lots of people after 2009 went and got whole home level generators for for their house or their business mm-hmm. uh, and that's a great thing and when those are installed professionally by a licensed electrician who puts the uh, appropriate transfer switch that that isolates that generator from our grid from the electric utility all is well and good uh, those portable generators that people will use, those are fine too. Uh, and, and whenever people put those outside and avoid the uh, toxic gases uh, that come with those, and they just run extension cords to you know certain appliances in their home that they want to keep powered, everything is okay. The problem comes in when someone takes a generator and, and hooks it into their service panel and it is not appropriately isolated from our system. So really the only way to make sure that you're doing that properly is to use extension cords for select appliances or to have a licensed electrician install a transfer switch so that you are electrically isolated. One of the problems that unfortunately affects uh, line workers in our industry from time to time, you hear about it just about every time there's a major storm, guys will be out making restorations and they don't realize that someone has a generator hooked up and unfortunately that is backfeeding onto our system. So even though that generator is producing a low voltage to serve your home, when it goes backwards through the transformer, it's producing primary voltage that, uh, that is lethal for our workers. Mm. So real hazard, uh, if the public could keep that in mind, not just for our folks, but for themselves, and, and whether it's the electrical hazard or the, or the toxic gas hazard, there's just a lot of do's and don'ts there that people need to keep track of. All right, so let's back up a little bit and go back to when a when a winter event happens and and maybe we lose power. If we uh, if 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 we we see a, a power line down, what exactly we need to do? I know we need to call, but how how does that process work? So I guess the first and most important piece of information is if you see a down line, don't go closer for investigation. It might be us, it might be telecom. Uh, some of those are very hazardous electrically and some of them are just hazardous because they're in the way, so to speak. Uh, but don't, don't be the one to go try to assess that situation. If you have a down line, uh, the best thing to do is to give us a call uh, and we have an automated system that, uh, that can handle a lot of that information. Lots of times we try to utilize that automated system when we have exceptionally high call volumes because it, it allows us to put manpower on restoration and that automated system will filter through what that outage call is. So it actually is the most efficient way for us to handle that. I know people love talking to a person mm-hmm. uh, and, and I get that. Uh, and we try to accommodate that when possible, but rest assured if you get the automated system and you enter your information, it is going to work even better than if you were speaking with one of the people because it, it filters it automatically. Um, one of the other important things to remember, and, and this happens lots of times, not just in a storm event, uh, but let's say a car hits a, a utility pole, okay? So line may fall down on that vehicle. We have an entrapment situation. Absolutely do not try to get out. And if someone comes and tries to help you, wave them off uh, because you or someone else could easily be electrocuted in the attempt to escape the vehicle. Mm -hmm. We need to get there. We need to make sure that we can de-energize everything and create a safe situation for the individual who's in trouble as well as first responders. All right. So I know in that situation, you would call 911 because it's an accident, but other down power lines, this is not a 911 call, correct? This is a call directly to uh, or a a message to you guys to to let you know their, their power has been interrupted. 
Right. Yeah. So if it's a, and Bryce, you know, you, you follow up on this, but if it's a hazardous situation and, and something is sparking or arcing or, or creating a public, an imminent public safety concern, uh, that, that probably might escalate to the level of 911. But if it's a report of a downline, absolutely they can call. And, uh, and whether they're fielding that, we're fielding that with a, a person or the automated system, making us aware that is useful information. All right, talk about when somebody's out of power, and, and this is back from my radio days, and even now when uh, we lost power the other day, and it was due to an accident uh, on New Glendale Road, people, um, people always want to know, well, when am, I, when am I getting my power back? Well, so-and-so got their power back. So w- when you're dealing with a grid, I mean, you, you work on getting larger amounts of homes back on first, right? I mean, so it's a, it's a big grid in instead of, a, instead of an individual house yeah. out, correct? Yeah, one of the things that I hear people say when we have one of these major weather events or a storm that creates widespread outages, inevitably I'll get feedback after the fact from folks that say, well, I saw a Nolan truck drive by my house four times and and I'm still off. That doesn't make any sense. Why is that happening? Well, the reality is we start at the substation level. And then we work our way down to the major feeder circuit level. And then we work our way down to individual taps and eventually down to the individual home level. But what people need to keep in mind is their power may be off. And that may be for one reason, which is widespread. And we can fix one thing and it would get 400 people back on. Or they may be dealing with a much more localized issue with their particular home residence or just the folks on their street. Mm -hmm. It could be both too, so which is why we always try to start at the high level and work our way down. So you may have four or five hundred people off, and the first thing that you fix gets three hundred and fifty of those back on, and the next thing you fix gets another forty or fifty back on, and then you'll end up where you're down to the half a dozen folks who have a localized issue that uh, that you can then handle on a case by case basis. But but that's why for some people. They may be the last one on their street on and they don't understand why. They could have a specific problem for their residents that their neighbors aren't exposed to. So those are the ones that take the longest to get restored at the the end, but that's kind of an explanation. There is a rhyme or reason to why we do this and how we do this, and it works pretty well for the most part. And that's one reason why we wanted to do this show is because during the uh, last ice storm, people were calling 911 to tell that their electricity was off. Well, we understand the electricity's off. 911 can't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, that's where you need to call your utility company and inform them. And the way Nolin's system is, they know what, what areas are off because of their electronic system, their notification system that they have internally. Uh, the only time we want to stress that people should call 911 is if the line is down in the road um, it's arcing. Um, there is a house fire going on where the, you know it's on the house, or it's or it's it's arcing, or like we said, we had a wreck. But nine one one has then in turn got to turn around and call Nolin itself. The only time we want to do that is if there is a hazard for the public, and we want to get that across, uh, Greg. That that is probably the most important thing um, because they're they're going crazy. Nine one one's going crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, we're trying to handle the emergency situations. The electrical drop from the pole to your house is not an emergency to us unless you are without oxygen or you have some type of medical device that you don't have. Then call us and we'll send an ambulance crew or another crew out there to transport you to a shelter or the hospital if need be so that we can get you taken care of for your medical need. That's that's where you would want to call 911, but we can't fix your drop. You know, that mm-hmm. that's something that the utility company and 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 we were just bombarded with calls that were not emergent. You know, it it, it it is well, it's emergency, emergency to, to somebody, and, yes. that's, and I think that but, that... but it doesn't present a danger to the public unless they've got some type of medical device that runs off electricity and we need to get them help. And I do remember with that ice storm, it seemed as the days progressed is when you started to see, you know, people getting a little panicky with stuff. And because it, it was a long process 
with that ice storm. It was it was absolutely crazy. But uh, the thing is, is information. We live in a world now, and you think about it. Uh, this this interview here, you know, will be on Facebook. Will be linked to YouTube. Or will be on YouTube. Will be linked to Instagram, and will be on seven different platforms of podcast. So there's multiple ways to get information out. But uh, talk about uh, good sources of local information when somebody wants to know about their power being out, or or they want an update on emergencies. Uh, both of you, I, what's the best way to uh, to get that information? Well, you know, everybody lives off social media now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one good thing about this that we're doing right now. This is right. this is going live on social Except media. It, unless you know. you're on MySpace. We're right. not on MySpace. But, <laughs> you know, Sarah Fellows and myself, uh, Sarah working for Nolan and the, and the other PIOs for other utilities, we're going to keep folks updated not only through our website, um, hcky.org, but also our Facebook site from Hardin County Government. And I know Greg does the same thing through their site, and it actually through their site shows uh, a percentage of households without, correct? Yeah, so we have a outage map available uh, on our website. Sarah Fellows, for us, uh, she keeps all of our social media outlets updated mm-hmm. to try to let folks know. Um, she can't necessarily speak to every individual situation, but she can speak to areas that are more problematic than others. Uh, additionally, um, we learned some things when we had a, a ice storm in November of 2018. So what we've done since that time, we have actually implemented some outage notification technologies where folks can sign up for notification of if their power is out. So for example, they might not be home uh, uh, and then they would need to know, hey, my power's out. Also, they may be out for a couple of days and then seek shelter somewhere else, we will send them a notification when their power is restored. So we've worked out some kinks on that. It didn't mm-hmm. work exactly as we hoped it would last year, but since that time, we've we fixed some of that stuff. We also now will provide a estimated time of restoration. So if, if someone has an outage, we're going to try to get a, give them an order of magnitude of, is this going to take a couple hours? Is it going to take six hours? Is it something that you should plan for two or three days to do something different because we're so inundated with activity, it's just going to take us a while to get there. So I think that we're doing the right things to, to try to let people know what the situation is. And I know when you have an extended outage, uh, we're going to have some shelters that will be put in place as well. We and, will. And so how will they get that information? That information will not only be put out through social media, but it would also be put out by local media as mm-hmm. well. Um, and, you know, we keep the local media informed. As you remember, we, you know, we've done several things over the years uh, through the media where we talk about where the shelters are, what's open. If you can't get a ride to the shelter, you need help getting to the shelter, we will send folks to pick you up. We did that, you know, in the 09 ice storm. So, I mean, it, it not just not just a regular not just the regular social media, but the actual media itself too. We're sending that out. And that's why I also said you need to have that, that radio there that's mm-hmm. battery powered. So if you are out of electricity, you can keep up with what's going on in your local community through local radio stations to be able to help, you know, find out where things are and what's going on and where to tune and where to go to get that information. Yeah. And if you need information on no lens power outages, you can uh, email me and I'll give you Sarah's uh, personal cell number and her <laughs> home number. So you can call. <laughs> I'm sure she would appreciate yeah, it. I know she that would. went in very well at all for me. I don't think. All right. So real quickly, as we wrap this up, let's talk about roads and uh, snow. Cause that's, you know, everybody's talking about the snow we're going to get. Right. We have quite a bit of mileage of roads that we have to, that you, I say we, like I actually do any of that, that you as a, as a team have to clear in our county. So uh, what can people expect with that? And, and I know everybody's like, well, my road's always the last. Uh, uh, Brace Shoemate's road's always first. That's not the case, right? No, because my road's in Radcliffe. That was a horrible county, representation yeah. of somebody yeah, from so, the county, too. Um, you but, don't sound like now, that at all. It, it, what people don't understand, we have 941 roads, over 565 miles of roads that have to be cleaned. And so, actually, we have a uh, snow cleaning uh, guide on our website that will tell you um, what roads are being cleaned at what period of time. And it has the snow schedule on our website that our road department follows. So, it would be very easy to see when your road is going to be cleaned. Um, and you know it, it takes some patience because if it's a heavy snow and it's snowing hard at the time just as soon as we get one place cleaned it could be covered up just in a short period of time so what we try to do is hit 
the highest travel roads. It's, it's like Greg talking about with electricity. You know, they're trying to take care of the largest amount they can first and then go out. What we're trying to do is to take care of the largest amount of travel roads first. And especially the problem areas that we already mm -hmm. know from past mm -hmm. history that, that we know that they need to be salted or they need to be scraped and salted first and then start hitting the subdivisions. You know, the subdivisions are the last areas a lot of times that we hit and i know people get upset but we're trying to keep the main roads clear so that we can get folks out traveling and get them to work and so on so there is a rhyme or reason but you can actually go we, we you know over the years we've developed that guide so people can see what the snow route is uh, for our cleaning crews and that's available on hcky.org all right so again this information is available kentuckysheartland.com if you're watching the video here just scroll down to the bottom and you'll see the links you're also seeing the links to the websites and the uh, facebook and the social media pages for both no land and both hardin county government uh great information guys appreciate the time uh hopefully we won't need this information this year but knocking on fake wood um, I, I think we probably will at some point need some of that information i would say they you know people call 911 just to see if muldrow hills open well, or to even you. see if school is in session listen to your local media yep. or follow it's social there. media it's it there. is there i promise you it's there they Believe try me. to get it out as fast as, as they soon can. as somebody puts it on facebook everybody and her mother shares it out it, it happens that way all right he's bryce shoemate hardin county government he is greg lee chief electricity officer <laughs> that's not really the <laughs> i hadn't heard that yeah. before yeah. that's good <laughs> <laughs> I'm Greg Milby, community storyteller, and this is Kentucky's Heartland. Thanks for watching.